Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, I'm I'm Brett. Um, I'm at uh, UPenn now, but this is uh, joint work with Rafi Ostrowski at UCLA and Mary Wooders at Michigan. Um, I was a postdoc at Michigan for the last uh, three years. So um, and Mary was just here visiting, I think, two weeks ago or something. Um, so the the point of this talk, I want to tell you about how to make um, basically expander codes, how to make them locally decodable or locally correctable. So. Um, locally decodable codes, right, are codes where they're error correcting codes that have a sublinear time decoding algorithm. So if you want only a small number of bits of the underlying message, right, you can get these back from uh, retrieve by reading only a small number of bits of the corrupted code word. And right, expander codes are these codes which are um, created by putting symbols on the edges of uh, expander graphs. And so the point of this work is basically we're going to show a decoding algorithm for this type of codes that's um, that's sublinear time. And um, as Avi was saying, this is the third work that sort of does this. Um, it uses a kind of different techniques, but um, for these locally decodable codes that have rate approaching one um, and sublinear time decoding, the first construction was actually in 2011. They were these multiplicity codes of Kaparti, Safra, and Yakanin. And then um, the affine invariant codes of Guo, Kaparti, and Sudan. And this is a kind of different um, technique. But just in terms of uh, sort of how fast I go through things, how what do, is everyone pretty familiar with the local decoding question or not so much? Yeah, uh, some, no. Is that, is that a mostly? Because I have. Okay, so anyway, I'll I'll go through. I have a bunch of slides in the beginning, but I didn't want to. Uh, if if people have been thinking about it a lot, I didn't want to um, sort of pain people. But. Here's the, the basic framework right? for error correction. You have Alice wants to send a message. So just this gets some framework, some uh, terminology in place. right? A message will always be x. The, the symbols um, will be from some alphabet uh, capital sigma. Um, right? And so traditional error correcting, you encode your message as a code word. And um, Bob wants to recover the, the message from, a, the, from the corrupted code word. And locally decodable codes just changes this, that instead of wanting the whole message, Bob now just wants a single symbol of the, um, of the message. And he should be able to do this by making Q queries to the corrupted code word. Right, so this is basically the idea of local decoding, is that you only want a single uh, symbol of the message, but you should be able to get it by reading only a small number of uh, bits of the corrupted, or symbols of the corrupted code word. And locally correctable codes is the same question, except now you want a symbol of the uh, uncorrupted code word. And you want to be able to get this from reading, again, only a small number of symbols of the corrupted code word. Okay. And so um, yeah, we're going to talk about these locally correctable codes here. So here's the, the formal definition. Basically says for every index in the corrupted uh, in the uncorrupted code word and for every possible message and for every um, possible corrupted code word W where the corruptions um, corrupt no more than a delta fraction of the code word, um, Bob should be able to get the, his index I correctly with some constant probability close to one. Um, and the, the locality or the query complexity will always be Q here. And so um, through this talk, we're basically going to allow the, the channel will be allowed to um, put out a delta fraction of errors adversarially. This will be a constant fraction, but we're not going to focus too much on what that constant is. It'll just be a small constant. And um, we'll be focusing instead on basically the rate and the um, query complexity. And yep. This is not deterministic. So the decoding algorithm will be randomized, yeah. And it has to, yeah, it has to be randomized, yeah, um, because basically, right, the way the quantifiers are, right, it's so it's for all indices, for all messages, and for all possible corruption patterns. You should have a good probability of getting um, the the symbol correct. And so, right, if if it were deterministic, the the adversary could always break some guesses because the adversary can create more than Q corruptions, right, and so if if the adversary knew Bob was going to make exactly these Q queries, he could just corrupt those points, and then Bob would have no chance of uh, decoding. Right? Um, and again, it's important that the quantifiers are this way. Right? If you just want to say um, it's 
you know, that this is the average probability over all indices or something, even the identity code just works, right? If you corrupt a delta fraction and I just, with probability one minus delta, I get one, right? But this you wanna say, no matter what the index and for all corruption patterns, you need this. And so for that to make sense, you need to have the decoder randomized. So this probability is taking over the, um, the, the randomness in the decoding algorithm. And the errors are always worst case. Um, and I just want to say quickly that, um, so we're gonna talk about local correctability, but um, for linear codes, this is a strictly stronger notion, right? So for a linear code, right, you can write it as a generator matrix G where the, the columns of G is the basis of the, the code, and encoding is just multiplying by this matrix. And if you just column reduce this matrix, it doesn't change the column span, right? But now it ends up sticking basically the message is the first set of symbols in the code word, right? This is just putting it in systematic form. Um, and what this means though is that if you can locally correct um, symbols of the code word, you can actually get symbols of the message because the first symbols of the code word are the message. Right? So, so we're always gonna talk about local correctability here, but all the codes we talk about will be linear, and so this is a strictly stronger notion. So if you wanna think about local decodability instead, you're welcome to do that, but um, we're just gonna talk about correctability because it's a little more natural. Um, and basically, again, the, the terminology we're using, X will always be the message, um, capital N will be the length of a code word, and we'll be talking a lot about the rate. The rate here is K over N, the number of message symbols divided by the number of code word symbols. And we're hoping to get the rate approaching one and the locality as small as possible, right? So this is the trade-off we're making, right? We want the rate to be as high as possible and the locality to be as small as possible. So right, there are lots of known um, locally correctable codes and the sort of simplest example are these Reed-Muller codes, right? And is everybody here familiar with Reed-Muller codes before? Has everybody seen a little bit? Well, basically, a Reed-Muller code, a message is a low degree multivariate polynomial and encoding is just you, you evaluate this polynomial at all points in the space. Right? So a message is this polynomial F and the encoding is um, the list of all the evaluations of F. And there's a really natural local correcting procedure for Reed-Muller codes. So for a Reed-Muller code, if this is some view of our points in FQ to the M, um, every point now has uh, the evaluation of the message associated with it. So if we wanna recover some symbol of the message, so this is the symbol of the message will be F of Z at some point Z in the space. Right, you, what you do, and I think people probably have, most of you have seen this before, right? You pick a random line through this point and you read all the points on that line. And the nice thing here is that if you take a low degree multivariate polynomial and you restrict it to a line, you get a low degree univariate polynomial. And so if you read all of the, um, whoops, I don't know what this thing's doing, but um, uh, if you read all of the points on this line, you get a, the evaluations of a univariate polynomial whose constant term is the, the point you are interested in, is this uh, f of z. And right, because this line was chosen at random, the points on the line, each point individually is uniformly distributed. So um, basically Markov gives you a nice bound on the total number of errors that um, occur on this line. And then you can use uh, read solemn and decoding to recover the point you were interested in. Right. So you query all these points on the line, you do read solemn and decoding, and you find the, the point you were interested in. And um, because the line was at random, even the, the line was chosen by the decoder right after the error pattern was set down. Right. So with high probability, there won't be too many errors on that, on any given line. Um, and so read Muller codes, you have lots of parameters to play with, um, but basically, Right, the rate is the number um, of uh, low degree, these degree D polynomials and M variables divided by the length of the code word, which is Q to the M because we evaluated it at all points in FQ to the M. Uh, the locality is Q because lines have Q points on them. Um, and so you can basically get these codes with constant rate up to rate one half. Um, and you can get the locality will be n to the one over m here, right? The locality is q and n is q to the m, so the locality is n to the one over m, 
and by changing m, we can get n to the epsilon for any epsilon. So this is sort of um, the classical construction that uh, that's sort of the, the benchmark. But um, oh, I thought I had another line here. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is uh, one of the questions that was open for a long time, right? Reed Muller codes give you query complexity n to the epsilon, but they have rate um, bounded by one half. And the question was, can you do better than this? Um, can you get arbitrarily close to one? And the answer is yes. The first constructions were only pretty recent. There are these multiplicity codes, where multiplicity codes are actually very similar to Reed Muller codes, except instead of just evaluating the polynomial at all these points, you also bundle in evaluations of its partial derivatives as well. Um, and this increases the alphabet size, but it gives you um, better uh, correction abilities. And lifted codes also form this. Um, uh, uh, it's a sort of a similar idea where you have a, a big space and you require that all of the projections down to small dimensional spaces form a code word, some small code that you're essentially lifting up. Um, so here's two constructions, and um, these both sort of have decoding that's kind of similar to the Reed Muller decoding in the sense that in the Reed Muller example, right, we, we restrict to a line. And when you restrict to a line, you get a Reed Solomon polynomial. Um, and then you use the Reed Solomon decoder to decode from that. Right? And this, um, both of these constructions have the same idea where the queries you make will turn out to be queries into a sort of a, a sort of natural subcode. Right? Um, just like querying on a line is naturally querying this um, Reed Solomon code that's kind of embedded in the Reed Muller code. Um, I certainly don't know how to do that. I'm not sure if you can show that that doesn't work. Um, but yeah, it's not known how to do that. But, and it, yeah, sorry, I don't know if it's known that it can't be done. I would assume though people would have tried that sort of early on and this I was a... Really? Yes. Yeah, and you get nice, you get nice list recovery properties, right? But I, I've never seen anybody say anything about um, local correctability from that. But yeah, so puncturing codes is sort of a natural uh, thing to do, but yeah. You mentioned the uh, local exception, local decodable code. Do you even know if it's redundant in the sense that you can take a line and every point on the line is a function of any other, uh, I mean, every value of the coordinate on the line is a function of the values of the other coordinates and so on. If you would like to do puncturing, you will have to do it in a very But in terms of decoding all coordinates, right, every point has a lot of lines through it. So even if some lines are killed, right, as long as every point has yeah. some fraction of lines through it that have enough, you, you have some hope. Um, because even, yeah, even if you lose a lot of lines, right, there's still. Most points have enough lines through them, and you just don't have a big data traffic. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, um, and I just want to say briefly, there's, a, there's another regime where people th think a lot about local decodability, and this is in the um, really uh, small query complexity case. So if you want 
instead of query complexity n to the epsilon. If you want constant query complexity, you can do this, and you can do it using these matching vector codes, which are before by Yukannon and then uh, Epromenko. And so here you get great locality. Um, the rate right doesn't approach one; it goes to zero, um, not quite exponentially, but slightly sub-exponentially. Um, but uh, these um, these codes are are also really cool, but it's a very sort of different framework. And one of the fundamental differences here is that the, um, the, the decoding is sort of simpler in the sense that um, if you're only querying three components of the code and the adversary is corrupted a delta fraction with you know, probability at most three delta, any of these is corrupted, right? So if you, if you don't have to worry about correcting errors in your queries, right? You can just sort of hope that if the, if the queries are individually uniform, right, with probability one minus three delta, all of the queries you make are uncorrupted if you're only making three queries, right? Whereas that kind of argument just falls apart completely. If you make n to the epsilon queries and the adversary is corrupted a delta fraction, right, a, most of the, I mean, about a delta fraction of the queries you make will be corrupted, right? So that's why these codes on the left really need um, to have sort of error correction in the decoder, right, where these, the codes on the right, um, don't need error correction in the decoder. Yeah. Well, right there, there. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. These are all locally correctable, right? So like, again, think of the the read Muller, right? You're you're reading um, symbols of the code word. Um, right. um, and so what I want to talk about today is these uh, decoders for the uh, for expander codes. And so this is in this regime on the left. The rate is approaching 1. The query complexity is n to the epsilon. But the, the thing that sort of separates it from the multiplicity and the lifted codes is that um, the queries we make actually won't form a sort of natural code word. They'll have some distance property that allows us to correct from some errors, but they actually don't form sort of code words in themselves in, the, in a traditional sense. And so when I explain how the decoder works, we can see that. But um, yeah. so um, here's uh, some basics on expander codes. So there are lots of different ways you can think about expander codes. Or, um, and we take this sort of Tanner formulation. So we're going to say we start with a, uh, a graph which is deregular, right? So it has nd over two edges. And we're going to start with uh, an inner code C0, which has length D. And so the idea of this is we're going to put code word symbols on the edges here. right? So there's some instructions where you put them on the nodes. We're going to think of this where you take a graph and you put s symbols on the edges. And the restriction is that for every node, if you look at the edges around that node, they should form a code word in the inner code. right? The every, every vertex or every node has D edges. And the inner code has length d, so right, it's natural to say that these edges, um, these d edges, form a code word in the inner code. Now, to to do this, we have to choose some ordering of the edges around every vertex, and we're basically not going to really worry about that. You just choose any arbitrary ordering. Is it directed? Uh, no, it's undirected, and um, we're not going to necessarily. Often, it's sort of nice if you make these bipartite. We don't really need that either. So to just think of it as sort of any graph. Um, it's not directed though. And um, we're just going to put uh, labels on all of the edges of the graph. So here's a, a quick example. If we start with the complete graph on eight vertices, right? Every node has degree seven, and um, so we pick some sort of um, some code of length seven. So just think of like the seven four three Hamming code. And the idea is, right, we assign a code word now as an assignment of a zero or one to every edge in the graph. There are twenty eight edges in the complete graph on, um, on eight vertices. And so uh, um, uh, code words will be now of length 28. And the, um, the requirements are that if I look at any node here, and I look at the, the seven edges coming out of it, that they should form a code word in the 743 Hamming code. Right? So for all eight vertices, I have this restriction that its neighbors have to be a code word in the smaller code. What's the ordering amongst the edges? What's the ordering on the edges? Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so that's the thing is you just beforehand you just have to pick some ordering, and we actually for our construction it's not important at all. In most of the constructions, it's not important. So when you choose your graph, you just choose some any arbitrary ordering that 
makes sense to you. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But um, right now, we're basically using bounds that work for any ordering. And so you don't have to worry about it. You just fix one beforehand and call it a day. What is the proportion of the number of colors with respect to the number of edges of the GPU? Um, so uh, you mean like how balanced is it in terms of? Right, it will, the balancing will be basically, if the inner code is pretty well balanced, you'll get a code that's pretty well balanced. Um, the number of colors, that's two colors, it just middles in one. Yeah, well yeah, so the, the so alphabet the size is the, is the alphabet of the inner code. So this, for this example, the Hamming code has an alphabet of zero, 01, so the outer code has an alphabet of zero, 01. But if I chose some, co I could use a large alphabet code, I could use a Reed solomon code as the inner code, and then the outer code would have the same alphabet size. So this preserves alphabet size completely. If that's, um, but the constraints of the decodes are naturally uh, you know, partitioned to constraints of every vertex. Yeah. And these constraints of every vertex are the same. Yeah. It's coming from some constraints. So yeah, here I'll talk a little bit more about how the constraints work. So first thing is actually, um, well, this gives a nice description of the code. It's not immediately obvious how you encode from this description, right? This says, here I can identify code words, but you certainly want encoding. But it turns out encoding is really easy because we're going to focus on inner codes being linear, and then the outer code will be linear. And encoding linear codes is sort of simple. You just look at the generator matrix and you multiply by it. Um, and the point of this construction is these Tanner codes basically make it very easy to calculate the parity check matrix, right? So the parity check matrix of a linear code um, is basically defined to be the code words are the kernel of the parity check matrix, right? And so I'll show you um, quickly how this so what's goes. The so the generator matrix in our notation, the columns are the basis for the code. So a code, a linear code, is just a linear subspace of some finite field, uh, some vector space over a finite field. Um, so the generator matrix has columns that are a basis for this subspace. So multiplying by it maps you into the subspace. And the, um, the parity check matrix is basically the matrix that is, kills the generator matrix. So the, the parity check matrix is the matrix whose kernel is the, um, is the, is the code word space. All right. So you can sort of move back and forth from one to the other and think about them in natural ways. But um, if you're talking about constraints, it's sort of more natural to talk about the, um, the parity check matrix. The parity check matrix basically gives you the list of the linear constraints that your code words has to satisfy. All right. Um, so right here, we, if we have an inner code um, C0, then right, it is the kernel of, some of its parity check matrix. Right? So being in the in the inner code basically means if you multiply by the parity check matrix, you get zero. Um, and so the Tanner code basically says that if we look at any vertex and we take the code word and we restrict it to the neighbors of that vertex, then when we multiply by this inner um, parity check matrix, we should still get zero. Right? This is, again, just sort of all the Tanner construction is saying. Um, and you can actually generate this parity check matrix really easily. If you look at just the edge vertex introduce matrix of the graph, so you have one row for each uh, vertex and a column for each edge. So the uh, columns have weight two because they're, um, you know, each edge hits two vertices, right? And the rows have weight equal to the degree. Then you can basically, the, to create the um, parity check matrix of the, the Tanner code, you just basically cram in the parity check matrix of the inner code. So right here in this example, we have the parity check matrix of the Hamming code. It has three constraints. On, and so for each vertex, we have to put in these three constraints. And so you just take where this is one, and you just cram it in there. right? And you look at the second vertex. It has these seven guys. And you just cram the same matrix into those seven coordinates. right? And you just keep doing this, and you get the whole matrix. right? So it's actually very easy to generate the parity check matrix for these Tanner codes. Um, and once you have the parity check matrix, you can compute its kernel, you compute the generator, and you can always encode. So encoding is sort of trivial for these things. It's not something you have to worry about. Um, and one reason I sort of went through this is to see also this, this construction gives you a nice bound on the, the rate, right? So if the, um, if the inner code has rate R0, that means um, it code words have to satisfy one minus R naught times D linear constraints. Right? The inner code has dimension D, and right, the, the 
the dimension of the code word space is plus the dimension of the constraints, right, is, is D. So we satisfy 1 minus R0 times D linear constraints. They're N vertices. Um, and so we have N times 1 minus R0 times D linear constraints that we've added. Right? Um, but now the length of these new code words is the number of edges. We put symbols on every edge. So there's N D over two edges. Um, and so we can just get a bound on the rate right away, which is um, it's N minus the number of constraints divided by N. And after some simplification, this is 2 R0 minus 1, right? where R0, again, is the, the rate of the inner code. Um, so the things to notice here, one is as the rate of the inner code goes to 1, the rate of the Tanner code goes to 1. Um, as if the rate of the inner code is less than 1 half, then basically this says the lower bound on the rate is negative, and it tells you nothing. Um, the other thing, though, is that in terms of how we've ordered these edges, right? When we calculated this rate, the rate basically we said was the rate is we, we sort of took this parity check matrix and we said, well, its rank is bounded by its number of rows, right? But that's a pretty weak bound. And in particular, right, it doesn't depend on the ordering of these constraints, right? We didn't use anything special. We just counted constraints and said, assume they're all independent and this is the worst that could happen. And so that's. Um, that's sort of nice and we don't have to think about the ordering, but it's kind of not nice in that it gives us this construction that only works for inner codes that have rate bigger than one half. Um, and that's, that's actually kind of annoying and something we'd really like to be able to remove. Um, and to remove that, you'd really have to be a little bit smarter about how you order the edges. Um, and actually, um, Tanner sort of noticed this originally in his original paper, he said, Here's some simple example. Look at the complete bipartite graph on seven, edge, on seven vertices, and the 743 Hamming code is the inner code. And he said, well, there are a lot of ways you can order the, vertice, the edges around a vertex. But he said, consider the natural ones. So these are the ones with lots of symmetry, the ones that you would actually choose if you were, had to, somebody said, pick some orderings. And he's, he actually then calculated by hand sort of what the, the parameters of this code you get are. And it turns out for different orderings, the parameters vary really widely. So here you have this, um, for one choice, you got this 49, 16, 9. So this means the code words have length 49 because there are 49 edges in a bipartite graph on seven vertices. Um, the dimension of the code is 16. So the rate is 16 over 49. Um, and 9 is the distance of the code, right? So all code words have Hamming distance at least 9. Um, the next guy, right, they all have length 49 because they're all on the same graph. Um, but if you choose a different sort of natural ordering of the edges, you get the um, rate goes down to 12 over 49, but the distance goes up to 16. And he tried some other things, and you got the, uh, the rate went down to 7 over 49, but the distance went up to 17. And if you notice, right, the, the sort of trivial counting bound we had before says the rate is always bigger than 2 times the inner rate minus 1. Right, the inner rate of the Hamming code is 4 over 7. So we have 2 over 4 over 7 minus 1 is 1 7, which is exactly this. Right, so this does match the lower bound. But right, just even a different ordering, you get twice the lower bound, even for the sort of simple codes. And so there's, it's, it's pretty clear that this lower bound is, is pretty weak. I mean, that you should be able to do better in, in certain situations. Um, but right, you, you meet it and sometimes. So you, I mean, you can't always do better. But, um, this is sort of a, an interesting to think, to think about. If you choose the inner code specially, and maybe it has some relation to the graph you care about, then you should hopefully be able to come up with a smarter bound than just saying the rank is the number of rows. Um, and that would give you a lot more flexibility, because then you could use inner codes with rate less than 1 half. Um, and so right, this Tanner construction works for any graph. We want to focus where the graph is an expander. And um, when the graph is an expander, you can get really fast decoding procedures. That's one of the really nice things about this, right? For all of the stuff with the Tanner codes that I was saying, right, you have really natural encoding. You have natural sort of distance properties. You have natural rate properties. But decoding is still not a trivial task. But if the inner code, if the graph is an expander, then you get uh, decoding that can be really fast. Um, where, again, this is this traditional notion of decoding where you want to decode the entire message. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's the sort of background. We have, this is what local correctability is. These are how expander codes are constructed. And now um, I'll talk about basically our construction. Yeah? Uh, 
No. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So here's the, the main result is that basically if we start with a deregular expander um, and an inner code of length D, which has this smooth reconstruction property, which I'll tell you in a second, then um, we give a local correcting procedure for this Tanner code that comes out of this. And smooth reconstruction is basically, it's a weakening of, um, of local correctability. And um, so here's smooth reconstruction is basically, if you're given a code word and you care about only some index, one symbol of it in red, you should be able to recover this index by making Q queries. And these queries, each individual query should look, should be um, uh, uniformly distributed in the code word. So you can query these or those and still get this red thing. And if there are no errors at all, then you should be able to recover um, the, this red uh, symbol. Right? So this is basically local correction when there's no errors at all. Right? It says that there's some algorithm that the, basically the information about this symbol CI is sort of uniformly spread. So I can make Q queries where each one independently is uniform. Um, and if there are no errors, I can recover CI. Right, so this is much weaker than um, local correctability because you don't have to worry about any errors at all. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All all the basically locally correctable codes sort of have this property because the 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 um, the decoder really wants to be able to make uniform queries. If the decoder's queries don't look uniform. Right, then the adversary can place the errors basically on the high probability queries. Right, so all of the constructions sort of have this property, but um, this is, uh, it, it's sort of much weaker. And um, there are lots of codes that have this smooth reconstruction that have no local correctability. Um, yeah, so we will give an example. I'll give an example at the end. The, the codes we end up using are these affine geometry codes. Um, and, but even sort of a, the, the sort of simplest example of if you don't care so much about what the, how is, if you only want Q to be a little smaller than N, just think of a parity check code that adds one parity check bit. You just add up all the, the bits of your message and add that parity check to the end. Then, right, um, you can read any symbol by reading N minus one other symbols at random. Um, but it doesn't, if there's any error at all, you're wrong. Yeah, I mean, so any, yeah, and in particular, right, any locally correctable code also has this property, and, um, right, so the Reed Muller codes have this. You want to have better rate than, yeah. Yeah, um, but, yeah, um, but you can, all the locally correctable codes have this property, and so in particular, you could throw in these previous um, constructions of locally correctable codes with rate approaching one that are, fully locally correctable like multiplicity codes or um, the affine invariant codes. They have rate better than one half, so you can use them in the Tanner construction. And they automatically satisfy this because they satisfy the stronger thing. Um, we try doing that. You get, you get worse rates than <laughs> um, as you might expect. You can also, um, we tried doing this recursively to see if you could get any benefits once you create some small code and you build this bigger Tanner code that has this property, then you could throw it into itself, right? And because it's locally correctable, so it's smooth. And that also doesn't help you. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll say, I'll show you at the very end the, the inner codes that we, to basically get some parameters, we chose some specific graphs and some specific inner codes. And um, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, right, this is what I've been saying. It's much weaker than um, local correctability because there's no errors. But it's sort of the natural um, weakening of uh, local correctability. It's a natural weakening. And this is the formal definition that basically you can always um, make a set of Q queries where each one is uniformly distributed. Okay, so, so here's going to be our uh, decoding algorithm. So we have some expander graph. Here's some little window looking at the edges. And right, a Tanner construction says we put symbols on every edge. So we have some edge. We want to recover the, um, the symbol on this edge. And we're going to assume the inner code has smooth reconstruction. And to make this 
dry diagram sort of work out nicely, we're just going to assume the inner reconstruction has query complexity two. So the inner code says that if I read two random edges, right, I can recover any other one. Right? And so remember, right, the, the Tanner construction says for any vertex, the edges around that vertex form a code word in this inner code with smooth reconstruction. And so for any, um, for any edge, if I read two of its random, two neighboring edges, according to the smooth reconstruction algorithm, these things will be randomly distributed among the D edges, and they will allow me to reconstruct the edge I want. So if I read these two green edges, for example, um, I could use a smooth reconstruction algorithm to reconstruct the blue edge, um, as long as there were no errors. Right? Um, and again, then, if I want to learn these two green edges, right, I can read two of their neighbors at random. And I could then, if I read these four guys on the outside um, and there were no errors, I could reconstruct the two green guys on the inside and then the, the blue edge that I care about. And I can keep going, right? I can sort of take this uh, query tree inside the graph. Um, so here, if I delete all the edges, it looks like, looks like this. And if I sort of just rearrange everything, right, I start with some blue edge that I care about. And now I'm going to take a, a walk down this, um, down this expander in the form of a tree, where it's a QWERY tree, where Q is the, the reconstruction parameter of the inner code. Right? And so each step by itself will be uniformly distributed by the smoothness of the reconstruction algorithm. And um, if I knew the symbols on all of the leaves and there were no errors, Right, the leaves would allow me to correct, correct their parents from smooth reconstruction. The parents would allow me to correct their parents. And I could correct all the way back up to the blue edge. Right? This is if there were no errors. And the nice thing is, right, because each path on this tree is a random walk and an expander, if I take a basically log n steps, I end up in a random position on the graph independent of the edge I started with. So that's good for me. Um, and the, the gain we get here is actually coming from the smooth reconstruction property, which is that, um, right, how many steps do I need to get uh, to a uniform position on an expander? Right, it should be basically something in terms of log base d of the number of vertices. But I'm getting uniform uniformity where I'm actually only choosing q edges at a time. So I only have, um, right, I have q to the log base d um, leaves. And so it's this ratio of q to d that gives me this n to the epsilon as opposed to n. Right? What is the ratio of q to d? Well, so that depends on the inner code. Yeah. 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 Right. So d is the length of the inner code, and q is the number of queries it takes to recover something. So the sort of the smaller the query complexity of the inner code is, the, the bigger the ratio of q to d is. Um, but in practice, right, both our Q and our D will be constant. And so this will just be some. But we can't achieve Q is equal to Q to the epsilon because of the guy at epsilon is the uh, uh, Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, so. Right. Yeah, so that's. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the thing is, right, we don't need a family of these inner codes. We just need a fixed one, right? And then we have a family of graphs. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Then you have, yeah, that's right. You need a family of epsilons, but for each epsilon, you know only one concrete example of this graph. Yeah, and um, and so again, at the end, I'll show you some. Uh, you can do this all from this one family of codes where we use these uh, affine geometry codes, where um, where it's sort of it's a very simple code, and then for any epsilon, you can get what you want here. Yeah. So, yeah, so you only query the leaves on this tree. But here's this problem here, right, which is that this works only if there are no errors in the leaves. And the leaves are basically uniformly distributed in a thing where a delta fraction have errors. So there are going to be tons of errors in the, um, in the leaves. Right? And that, that's actually the, the pig issue. right? So this is um, like, uh, sort of pretty straightforward that there are errors in the leaves. Right? And the errors propagate. Right? If there's an error in one leaf, it goes up to its parent, and it really it propagates all the way back up. So we have to figure out something that will allow us to um, fix these leaves. And so 
the idea is basically we're going to take another random walk to correct the leaves here. So we'd like to learn the leaves on this green tree with no errors. So we're going to take another random walk of also of the basically a order of log n steps. And um, there we're actually going to read the entire purple tree. So for the green tree, right, we only need to know its leaves, right? For these purple guys, it's true that if we knew the leaves here with no errors, then we could get back up to these green leaves and back up to here. But there are definitely going to be errors down here. So here we're going to actually read the entire purple section, and we're going to try to do some error correction that will allow us to get these leaves without too much, um, without too much error. So we're going to take one random walk. And the purpose of this first random walk is that it gets us to a uniform position. Right? The reason we don't take, I mean, you could just read the whole tree. If you, you save a little bit by not reading the green, but not tons, because most of the weight is at the bottom. But intuitively, right, um, what we're doing is uh, right, we're taking this random walk. And the purpose of the first random walk is to get these trees to be rooted at a random position. Because right? this tree is rooted at the edge we want to um, at the index we want to read, which is not uniformly distributed, right? We so you're telling me the, the, the majority is correct here? Um, so a majority of what? Yeah, so if we're in two, you would query the six and the... Yeah, so, um, so you could query, if you query each one out, so if you say for at each vertex you make, you know, three Q queries and you take the majority of these three, you still get errors pretty quickly, right? Because this thing is just so intolerant, if there's any error at all, right? And so if I take the majority, if I take you know, five Q and I take the majority, still with constant probability, right? There's, um, the majority is wrong. And so I have n to the epsilon edges though, and so I'm still kind of dead. Um, so the thing about this though is this actually, this second tree allows us to sort of do the correction that we want. So we have this purple tree. We've read the whole tree. Um, and this tree also has the same problem. But right, the problem is that you might end up with a path from the root to the leaf that are all in error. And essentially, the idea here is that this is the only thing that can go wrong. And so formally, what that means is that suppose I have two trees like this that came from a valid code word, and there are no edges, I mean, there are no errors at all, but they have a different root value. So if I, have, I, I get take two trees, they, they have different edges on their root, and then I look at the symbols in their tree, there must be a complete path from the root to a leaf where, all, where they differ um, all, along every edge of this path, right? So, so assume, is, OK, so the assumption is assume we have two trees, there are no errors, and they have a different root. OK, yeah. So then, right, you'd like to say, if this were like a, somehow an error correcting code, you'd like to say if the root were different, then there would be a constant fraction of different things. But you can't say that. But what you can say is if you have two trees and they have a different root, then they must have a path on which they diverge, which they're different on every um, edge of that path. Yeah, so yeah, of yeah. So basically I, I pick two QRE trees, I pull them out of my code word, and now right, it's just for yeah, is is it edge one, edge two, edge three, up through edge q. Right? There must be some path in which they're oh. um, basically it just follows from induction, right? So they have one they have one edge, so they're different on their root, so they have one of they have to have one of their children different because their children define them. And so then Right, and then they have one of their children going down. Right. So it, yeah, that, it's, um, it's a short argument to show that. But basically, this is what this means when you say this is the only thing that can go wrong, is that if we're thinking about the no error case, then you must have a full path that's gone wrong. So now, the idea here is we can use this for a correction algorithm. So now, we, we read this purple tree, right? And it has errors in it. But the question is, can we, if, if we want to, um, we can look at sort of the, the path length that's inconsistent. And here, uh, maybe I'll show it in the next slide. Here's, here's how the decoding algorithm works, right? 
The idea is that for any other valid tree, there must be a full path on which they diverge. But this tree has this nice property that the root was at a random location and all the edges were at random. So basically, the, um, the errors that the adversary puts into this tree are completely uniformly distributed. And the only way the adversary can create a tree that looks like a tree with a different root is if he corrupted an entire path down this tree. So the adversary will have corrupted a, a constant fraction of the edges on this tree, but he probably will not have corrupted uh, an entire path, right? Because everything looks random, right? The probability that corrupts an entire path is, is exponentially small. Yeah? But these are not, I mean, like adjacent trees in this uh, world are not independent of each other. You're using like a walk yeah. type. Okay, so yeah, they're not, they're not completely independent of each other. That's true, right? Because, um, but they're, each one individually is uniformly distributed in the graph. And that's basically enough to, uh, right. Um, since you're taking a walk on expand, you're trying to use something better, like uh, that there's a yeah. fixed set of curves tied to delta yeah. instead of an expand to walk on expand. Yeah, yeah. So basically, but we want something specifically just about paths. We want to say that if I start at a random position and I take this random tree walk on the expander, that the probability that any path has more than a half fraction of errors. So if delta is much smaller than one half, the probability that any path sees more than a delta fraction of errors um, will be exponentially small. That, that's the property we, we have to get, and that's what we do get. But, um, so ultimately, are you taking the mean bound over the various paths? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so the, the decoding algorithm then is basically just to count, you start at the bottom and you count the length of the longest path and error, the longest error path that you would need to get this green edge. So, so say we have these, here are some symbols on the bottom, right? Um, and we start at the, the leaf and every leaf says basically at each edge, we're going to count the number of errors you need to get to here. So here we're at the first step. This guy has a 1 on him. And so if his true value were 1, then there would be no errors so far that we've seen. If his true value were 0, then there would be, um, there would be a, a path with 1 error that takes me up to here. And now imagine, again, a simple local corrector. So imagine, right, so again yeah, so, um, so basically we're going to go up. We're going to start at the leaves. And we're going to move up a level each time. And each time, we're going to count how many errors would need to occur. What's the path with the longest errors that would need to occur to get me to where I am with the symbol that I have on me? So, um, so here we start at the bottom, right? There's, he has no children below him. And so to get to, say, this node where this guy were a 1, how many errors would you need between this node and the bottom? You'd need zero errors because he has a one on him already. If his true value were a zero, to get from here to the bottom of the tree, you'd need one error. The error would have corrupted here. Um, okay, and so then we move up a level. And so to move up a level, you have to think about the, the correction algorithm for a second. So here, just for simplicity, we're going to assume the, the smooth reconstruction algorithm of the inner code basically says it reads two parameters and it takes the, the XOR of these two and that's the value of its, um, of its, of the edge you were considering, right? This is how most of these things work, but for this, this is, whatever the actual correction algorithm is, this works. This is just to make this slide really simple. So if you read, if your two children were zero, then you should be zero, right? If your two children were zero, one, or one, zero, then you should be one. If your two children were one, one, then you should be zero. That's just, that's, if there were no errors, that's how all of these things should look, right? That's, it's defined by the correction algorithm, whatever the correction algorithm happens to be. And this is sort of the simplest one you can come up with. So, so now let's look, we're on this edge, right? And we want to count how many paths, uh, what's the length of a path in error. So you say, if this guy um, were zero, right? Then he would have to be wrong and Right, one of his children would have to be wrong, right? So say if this guy were zero and this guy were zero, then you'd have a path with two errors, right? Because this guy was actually one, right? If this guy um, uh, were one and his children were zero one, then you'd have a path with no errors to get me from here, right? If this guy were one zero, then you'd have um, a path with one error, right? 
um, at least one of his children would have to be wrong. And if this guy were zero like this, then you'd need a path with at least one error. Um, and so this guy now can say, right, if since this guy is actually consistent, when I get to the top, there is a path with no errors that gets me a zero here, right? I mean, that gets me a one on this edge. And there's a path with one error that gets me a zero on this edge. So every, every edge now is going to basically pass up to his parent a value of saying, if, if you want me to be a zero, this is the path length of errors you'd need. If you want me to be a one, this is the path length of errors you'd need. So, so can you uh, maybe clarify, so if this code was just parity or something? Yeah, so that's what this, this, this so code is parity, yeah. This one is. Yeah. Yeah, but this, this is just for an example. So this is, because these codes are of constant size, you, whatever the... Well, the codes you have in mind are not constant size. Well, no, the, the so codes are constant size, and so we, can, we don't have to worry about sort of any kind of decoding, right? These, these edges can basically make, sort of do maximum, I mean, they can just sort of iterate over all possible symbols. Basically, yeah. every, every edge is going to pass two values up to his parent. Um, or in this case, if it's a binary code, it'll pass two values up to his parent. How many, um, what's the longest path length of errors you'd need, what's the shortest path length of errors you'd need to get me to be a zero? What's the shortest path length of errors you'd need to get me to be a one? And then its parent will do the same calculation of if I want to be a zero, here's what my children have to be. And now I know how many errors I need to get my children to be those values. And so this essentially just goes up and counts the shortest path of errors you'd need to get any specific value on any edge. Does that make sense? So again, so this. This not in terms of likelihood. Or anything. No, there's no likelihood at all. It's just. Yeah, yeah. It's just. It's not the no, no. It's just counting the number of errors you'd need. It's. Along a path. Along a path. So I want to say if I want to be. Why does that make sense? Okay, because. Um, what, what these trees have is, so if basically the reason, okay, so the idea here is that we're gonna count the number, what's the fewest number of errors along a path we would need to make this root what it is or something else, right? And the, the guarantee we have is that for any two distinct roots, right, there must be a full path of, um, there must be a path of complete depth, right, that, um, that's all different. So if you want to make me confuse one root with another root, you have, to com you have to put errors in at least, right, half of that path that was wrong, right? So, so if I basically, the question is, right, I want to know what's, what's the value that's going to be on here. And I know it's going to be a 0 or a 1, right? And now, because the inner code is, is binary in this example, but um, now, if, if this were 0 versus if it were 1, I know that there must be a full path on which these, any two trees, if, if one tree has a root 0 and one tree has root 1, right? I know that there's a full path. Somewhere in those two trees, there's a full path on which they're different. So if my true value were supposed to be 0, and you want to make me think that the true value is 1, you have to put errors on basically at least half of that path. So basically, this is sort of a funny type of error correcting code where the distance is not defined uh, in terms of Hamming distance, it's defined in terms of path distance. So if I look at two trees with different roots, I want to claim right that they, um, and you, they all have, they have a path which diverges of length order of log n. And so if you put errors on paths and you want to make me switch from one root to another root, you have to make a path, you have to put errors along a path that has at least half of the path, half of the symbols on that path are an error. Errors are worst case. Yeah, the errors are worst case. But, 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 yeah, but so the errors are worst case, but they're worst case before you do the decoding algorithm. So actually, in this model, the errors essentially are random. They're independent of this path because they were worst case, but they were fixed before I did the decoding, right? So that's actually the big. I don't understand. Okay. Errors are always fixed before you do the decoding. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So the errors are worst case, right? But now, 
my decoding says I'm going to take a walk through a tree, right? And so I'm going to walk through here. And this walk will be randomized. So the decoding algorithm is randomized. And the point is that, so this blue edge is not, um, is not random. It's worst case, right, relative to the error pattern. But as I walk further and further away, I take this random walk, right, my, the, these edges, right, become less and less correlated with the error pattern. So now I take this walk down. Right after I take an expander walk of length log n, these edges basically are totally uniformly distributed, independent of the thing I wanted to read, and in particular, independent of the error pattern now. Uh, okay. okay. Um, and so then, uh, this tree is nice, but the, the top root is dependent on the error pattern, right? But the leaves are not. So then I take the second walk where it starts at these leaves. These leaves are independent of the error. The, this is a random walk, so these guys are totally independent of the error pattern. Okay, so that's the property I want to use. And now the so second. This query pattern in your local code has to be very. I mean, you're yeah, the, yeah, levels. yeah, exactly. It's it's so a lot of randomness. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. So yeah, it's the 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 this query tree is basically completely independent of the error pattern. And so you can think of that and the other way, right, is saying that the errors are placed probabilistically on this tree. Okay? So, yeah. so is it that uh, the root of the purple tree is going to be decoded correctly as long as there is no path which has it's more, more than, than Yeah, exactly. And now you want to show that this probability is extremely small. Yeah. And, and showing that probability is extremely small is, is actually pretty straightforward because we can basically, right, you're in this position where the errors, you have a delta fraction of this tree is corrupted completely at random. What's the probability that you have um, more than a half fraction of any path is corrupted, right, will be exponentially small in the ratio of delta to one half, right? And, and for the, uh, just want to clarify this. Yep. So are you using the fact that you're taking a standard walk? Yeah, yeah. That's Um, so all the individual coordinates, as Andy said, like all the yeah. individual coordinates are uniformly yeah. dependent, let's say, are uniform, but it's not that two neighboring vertices or two neighboring edges are um, That's right. Um, yeah, that's right. The, these two edges, right, are not independent of each other. But um, uh, no, but we, we're still going to be able to take a union bound, right, because f fix any edge. Right, the probability that edge is in error is um, is yeah is is delta. Then um, right. So if I look at uh, okay, yeah, you sorry, you're right, you're right, yeah, yes, yes, you're right. You do have to use this property of yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what you want to get is that the list of the green tree will be all correct. Yeah, and that so we need this very strong property from this, which is. So after we do this correction, um, so we do this correction where basically we just count the path length. And at the top, we're going to get some value of, we do this going up. Um, and at the top, we get something. If my correct value were 0, then there would be a, you would need to have a path of, you know, um, of you know, approximately log n errors. And if my correct value were 1, then there would be a path below me that needs only you know, some constant number of errors. And so then the output basically will be you choose the value that has the shortest path length, right? Um, and so, right, this only way this fails is that if there is a path that's heavily corrupted, right? Um, and uh, yeah, you. What would happen if you just put the, you just uh, decoded from the root? Right. So, so you're, uh, that you, then be using the value. Sorry. Yeah. Right? Then so then you right. Want yeah, if you just decode from the leaves, right, you have the same problem you had before, right? Why do you have any class of class for um, Right, so again, this is this thing of that um, because essentially, I mean, the, the intuition is. Yeah. Yeah. If you have the set of fraction delta and the graph, and you take a random path, the probability that you will have much more like a red graph. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, and so that's so that's when we choose the graphs, right? We just choose. We basically say you choose a Ramanujan graph, and you have great. I mean, I mean, just to get some numbers, right? You get a, yeah. But this is how the the construction works here. Um, so here's the inner codes that we we looked around a little bit for codes that had sort of the gave us the best parameters. These are very simple, and they gave us basically as good of parameters as you could hope. These are these affine geometry codes. So here's the parity check matrix. The parity check matrix looks like this. You have um, a column for every point in FQ to the M. You have a row for every R flat. And then um, the parity check matrix is a 0 or 1, depending on whether that point is in that affine space. OK? Um, and then right, this has this very natural uh, local um, or smooth recovery algorithm, which is that if I want to know, right, so the, this is the parity check matrix. So the symbols of the messages, uh, sorry, the code words in this code, right, have to be, um, have the dot product with all these rows to be zero, right? So if I want to know the symbol here in a message, right, I can read all of the q to the r minus one other points in that r flat. So I pick a random r flat that intersects that point. I read all the other positions, and then I know right, that um, these other positions basically form a parity check for, for that guy. And if I choose a random R flat that contains x and I read all the points on it, they're individually uniformly distributed. Right? I mean, it's basically, again, sort of you can think of this as, uh, as the Reed-Muller case where you're looking at lines, but now we're looking at R flats. Um, but right, this has very poor local uh, correctability properties, right? If any of these guys is wrong, then the output is wrong. Right? So if there are any errors, this doesn't work. But I can recover this symbol by making uniform queries into the code word. Um, and uh, this is not a good locally correctable code, but it is a nice linear code with smooth reconstruction. And you have a lot of freedom to play with these parameters, and, and you can get exactly what you need. Um, uh, so, so these are the inner codes that we choose. Again, I was saying we tried some various other uh, constructions, right? We tried saying, what if you throw in multiplicity codes because they're locally correctable and so they have smooth recovery? If you throw in affine invariant codes, or if you throw, you do this construction recursively, you do something and then you throw this back into itself, and this gives you the best uh, stuff. And these are essentially some of the base codes for the affine invariant codes, anyway. Um, uh, but yeah. But this is sort of a concrete example that's, that works pretty well. Um, so, so if we choose um, yeah, the graph to be a Ramanujan graph and the inner code to be a finite geometry code, we get this statement that says for any alpha, we can get rate 1 minus alpha. Right? For any epsilon, we can get locality n over d to the epsilon, so basically n to the epsilon, because again, d will be constant for us. Um, and it tolerates some constant error rate that is constant, but goes to zero depending on alpha and epsilon. Um, so yeah, we don't really optimize the error rate specifically, but you get constant rate. Um, and so uh, yeah, this gives basically a, a new construction of these um, locally correctable codes with rate approaching one. Right, the only previously known ones were these multiplicity codes, which were the reed mullers with um, partial derivatives thrown in and the affine invariant codes. This gives you a kind of different, um, more combinatorial construction with these guys. Um, so originally, when we started thinking about this, we really were actually interested in the low query complexity regime, like with the, um, uh, mul the matching vector codes, like the Yukan and Efremenko stuff. And it sort of became clear that that wasn't, we couldn't, I don't know, we got this route sort of went faster. <laughs> Than that route, and it seems sort of hard to to get that kind of low query complexity with this type of regime. Um, but one thing that would help you at least get the query complexity down a little bit was if you could use inner codes with rate less than one half, right? So if you could choose an expander where d now is not constant but was much bigger, you could take many fewer steps. Um, but then the inner code would still need to have rate bigger than one half, and you can't have um, you can't have good uh, inner codes that have really long length and really good rate. That's the thing we don't know how to <laughs> do. Um, and so we're sort of stuck using um, only these codes that have the inner codes that have really high rate. 
And so it would be really nice if we could basically relax this, if we could choose some codes that have some nice interaction with the graph that would allow us to use a uh, rate better than one half, then we could sort of get mixing faster and um, we wouldn't have to, uh, we wouldn't have to take quite so many steps, right? Because again, this, um, uh, this epsilon and the n to the epsilon query complexity is coming from this ratio of q to d of the inner um, query complexity versus the inner length. But if the inner length has to be constant in order to get the inner rate above a half, then we can never have that ratio get too small. But if the inner rate, um, if, the, if d could get much bigger, then we could get epsilon much smaller. Um, but we can't do that and still <laughs> um, keep the rate above one half. But we sort of know that th this rate one half bound is, is, um, is really pretty weak in most cases. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, what I have.